the passage that we're going to consider heavily borrows from Psalm 22. So we're going to reread portions of this psalm. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, and drawn on the praises of Israel. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and were rescued. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not a man, scorned by mankind, and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their hands. Trust in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb, made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of patience surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shed. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evil doers encircles me. They've pierced my hands and feet. I, count, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. Oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You've rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he is not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he is not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Amen. <clears throat> then we turn to Mark chapter 15, verse 33 to 41. Sorry, the passage isn't there. Just turn to your Bibles. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachitan, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, 
and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also other women, many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. My brothers and friends, imagine that you were in Jerusalem on this dark Friday. You've been following from the time when Jesus had been arrested, taken to the temple. You've been watching and waiting as the trial takes place in the temple courts with the Sanhedrin. At night. Then early in the morning, you come again to see what's going to happen to him. And he's taken to Pilate in the Antonio's fortress. There is back and forth between the Sanhedrin and Pilate. And then there is a back and forth between Pilate and the crown. And the verdict is forced that he must be crucified. And then Pilate, notwithstanding the fact that Jesus has been found innocent by his own conscience and by the facts before him, he orders that he be scourged. And yes, Jesus is scourged, that nine lashes, so severe that he is almost bleeding to death. And this man is forced to carry his own cross. Barely any strength is remaining, but he must carry and bear the heavy load of the cross. But his energies are coming to an end as every step is taken. The soldiers realize it. Then there is this man, Simon from Cyrene, is forced to bear the cross for Jesus all the way to Golgotha. Then they get there. You're looking from the distance, everything that is happening. There, they nail him, the first iron nail through his body. Blood gushes out. And groans of agony comes from Jesus. And he's lifted up the cross. Every word that he utters is a heavy load on your heart. And it's so heavy that your eyes cannot bear it. Tears come down. Then you notice that it's getting weird. The light of sun is failing. It's getting darker and darker. As the sound tearing voice of the Lord goes out, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? And you consider all that has happened. But you, know, you don't know what it means until you hear this Roman soldier say, truly, this man was the son of God. And there lies your hope. There lies the sacrifice offered once for all. For everyone, man, woman, child, whether a Roman centurion or a Jew, whoever it is, because the Lord finally declares, it is finished, it is done, the mission is accomplished, accomplished for you. This is what you've come to hear. The good news of the world. That Jesus Christ is a savior. He has been the savior. Since the creation of the world. He is the savior today. Today I press him upon you. So that you may believe in him. And by believing in him. You may have life. And if you've believed in this Jesus. My dear brother and my sister. You don't need to doubt. You don't need to walk in despair. You have full assurance. You have confidence to draw to the throne of God. This is the Jesus Christ that has been preached among men in all the nations. And everyone who's believed him has become a Christian. And there is hope for him eternal life. And if you're asking, what shall I go home with? You could go home with hope and assurance of your faith. He is not dead. He is risen. And there lies our hope. In a sense, I don't need to say more. Because when we consider this passage, we see that the mission of Christ is complete, is accomplished, fully accomplished. So we don't come here to hear empty words. We come here to have our hope solidified. We don't come here to sit down and go back empty-hearted. No, we come here and we go back with our hearts full laden with hope and assurance. And I pray that that will be a reality for everyone here, whether young or old. So very quickly, I want us to consider this passage, so that we may again and again have our hope assured. But that's why we can. So then, what was the extent of this mission that Jesus Christ accomplished? We read in verse 33 that at noon, that is the sixth Power, by our reckoning, darkness crept. Gaining from where the Lord Jesus Christ hung upon the cross, beginning from Golgotha and spreading through the whole land, there was darkness. The approach of the death of Jesus demanded that the created order would bow in all. So the external nature displayed tokens 
as it were, of sympathy with great catastrophe. The sun was obscured, as Luke writes, by the sovereign heart of God, so that it could not dare shine when its maker died. And this is not an ordinary astronomical eclipse of the sun. It isn't. Three things from this passage show that this is the sovereign heart of God. Obscuring the sun. And effectively the moon because the moon depends on the sun. First of all, this can't be solar eclipse because during the Passover, it was full moon. And secondly, there has never been a solar eclipse that would last three hours from noon to 3 p.m. You know, that that was half the time when the Lord hung upon the cross. And this could not have been solar eclipse because it covered the whole land or the whole earth can be translated either. Obviously then, it could only have been half the globe but it means that the other half was already in darkness. And so the whole earth was engulfed in darkness. You know that darkness in scripture is usually a sign of God's judgment. So this meant that the judgment of God was upon the whole earth. God's extensive judgment was indicated by the darkness that covered the whole land, just as it, had, it was upon the whole land of Egypt. You can look that up in Exodus chapter 10. The whole land of Egypt was upon darkness because God's judgment was upon Egypt. The ninth plague was that of darkness. And you also know that the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn sons. The death of the firstborn creation. And we know then that after the darkness that engulfed the whole land that dark Friday, was then followed by the death of the Son of God that brought hope for us. Because then, the Lord Jesus Christ died to show that the wrath of God, all of God's wrath, was cast upon one man, Jesus for the whole earth. He was our substitute. He suffered most intense agony, indescribable woe, terrible isolation of darkness and forsakenness. Hell came to Calvary that day and the Savior descended into it and bore its horrors in our state. That is the extent of Christ's mission. Well might the sun in darkness hide with sun and shut his glories in when Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. The extent of this mission was abandonment Theologians use the word dereliction, which means to be forsaken, to be 
left alone to be abandoned and he was abandoned by God. The victims of the cross would usually shout in the outrage of pain. Some would be cursing wildly in unspeakable despair and frustration. But their strength could not bear it for more than an hour. The darkness that enveloped Jesus in his death makes visible what the cry of the religion declares and draws into sharp relief the breath and depth of the passion or suffering of Christ. The Lord, you know, from the rest of the Gospels uttered seven words while he hung upon the, the cross. John records three and Luke records three. But Mark and Matthew records one, which is the most central in the words obtained from the psalm that we read. Psalm 22 verse 1. Jesus shouted in agony, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he was forsaken and abandoned of God. And you know, those words must be understood from two perspectives. The first perspective is that upon him, the holy wrath of God was cast in all its intensity and immensity. And he could not run away from it. He was abandoned by God. And he experienced the full extent of the wrath of God. And secondly, these words must be understood from the perspective of the terrible character of sin. God, Habakkuk records, is too holy to behold evil. And so then, if our sins were all cast upon Jesus Christ, how could God, who is infinitely holy, possibly look at him? Jesus offered himself to bear the full judgment of God upon human rebellion. And so in these words, he described the pain and the agony of being alienated from God as Father. So his cry expresses the full horror of separation from God and the immensity of the curse that was upon him. The cry of the religion expressed the unfathomable pain of real abandonment by the Father. And that must not be reduced. The sinless Son of God died the sinner's death. The sinless Son of God experienced the bitterness of desolation. The cry it's a ruthless authenticity which provides the assurance that the price of sin had been fully paid. However, we must also note that the cry as terrible as it was in expressing the abandonment, it also underscored the close love that exists between the Son 
and the Father. For even in that inferno of pain, he was close to God. As he still to call him my God. In these words, my God, he affirmed their unchanging relationship of love and harmony. In this, the harmonious unity of the Godhead is described at its best. Even though the event itself posed a threat to this glorious unity. The cry was misunderstood. I wonder whether it was deliberate <clears throat> to mean that Jesus was asking for Elijah's intervention to help him from his agony. You know, there was a popular folklore that Elijah will come in times of need to protect the innocent. And so then that explains why they were saying, oh, wait. Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down in verse 36. But why were they not as familiar with the scriptures as they were with such stories? Because when the Lord uttered, my God, my God, they should have immediately remembered, oh, that is Psalm 22 verse 1. There is our Messiah. There hangs our hope. The sacrifice is being paid. But that is not just the far that the, the, the mission went. Because the Lord went as far as to die. We read that, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last in verse 37. That is, Jesus actually breathed his last in other words, he gave us, he gave up his spirit, as recorded in John 19, verse 30. He yielded up, he yielded his spirit, as recorded by Matthew, in Matthew 27, verse 50. In the words that he breathed his last, Jesus, the son of David, the son of Mary, the son of God in his body, actually experienced real death. The death of his body. He died. He stopped breathing. His heart stopped. His blood stopped flowing through his veins. His sensory nerves ceased to feel, and all his fleshly faculties failed completely, so that he was clinically dead. Within a few minutes, his body was cold. His body became limp and motionless. Horrors, the very horrors of death was upon his body. And that is the farthest we go on his mission for today. The Bible puts it like this. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. So then we ask, because we shall consider the burial another time. So we ask, what was the outcome of this mission? We read elsewhere that before he breathed his last, he gave the shout of victory, which is recorded here by Mark, that 
verse 37, and Jesus uttered a loud cry. Now, that loud cry is, it is finished. John chapter 19, verse 13. That most faithfully describes the fact that the mission was accomplished. What were the results of this mission that was successively accomplished? First of all, we read that the to- there was the curtain of the temple that was torn from top to bottom, providing direct and unlimited access to God. As I have pointed out to you before, Mark is a master of recording simultaneous events. And so we have been camping, observing what is happening at Calvary. That's where we've been. But then he also immediately takes us back to Jerusalem into the temple. And he tells us that the curtain was oh, red. From top to bottom. He reckons that as soon as Jesus made that loud cry and breathed his last, there was another event in the temple. The curtain that separated the holy of the holy place and the holy of holies was torn in two from top to bottom. It was not left at some point, it was torn completely. To become two pieces. Not by a human heart. Because a natural cause could not do that. And a human heart could only tear it from bottom up. This is a human, it's a a sovereign heart. It was by the heart of God. And it symbolized that the way into the presence of God had now been made. There was no longer any need for an animal sacrifice. No need for, a, uh, for, a, for, a, for, a, 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 for the blood of animals to be taken there. No need for another high priest. The last sacrifice had been offered. The last sacrifice had been accepted. But the last sacrifice had been offered by the ultimate high priest. And he's not just... High priest. He is the great high priest. And that is like saying the highest of the high priest. Forever. Once and for all. And that is to say that there was no longer need for another high priest because all had been welcomed as long as they are in Christ, the great high priest. That's why the, the veil was no longer necessary because all who are in Christ by faith are welcome to enter the holy of holies. And that's what we are, brethren. We are not just priests. We are a royal priesthood. That's what we are. But first of all, I want you to realize that the reading of the curtain meant that since we've been justified by faith, that is faith in Jesus Christ, There is now no condemnation because we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we've also obtained access, unlimited access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's what it means. It means that because Jesus Christ has removed the barrier, we now have access into the throne of God. 
No more hindrances. No more uh, veils. No more barriers. They've all been brought down by this once and for all sacrifice. But it also means that Christ having appeared as a high priest of the good things that, were, that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and cows, but by means of his own blood. Thus securing an eternal redemption. So there is real salvation. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of our ephah sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of new covenant. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death has occurred that redeems. Redeems us from Transgressions committed under the first covenant. So the Lord has brought us into this new covenant. And this new covenant extends from now all the way to eternity. It extends from now here on earth all the way to heaven forever. And brethren, if that does not make your heart skip a bit, because of excitement and joy that we have in Christ, then I don't know whether you, you've known the Lord Jesus Christ and this wonderful sacrifice that he offered. Because the Lord did not just enter the Holy of Holies on earth, he entered the heavens. And that's where he is calling us to come. And whenever one of us is called, we go to be with the Lord. We go to be with him forever. Will you then be scared of death when your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, has gone before you? He's become your forerunner? He is there? No. Christians don't fear death because Christ has taken away its sting. But then secondly, we also consider the testimony of the centurion. He said, truly this is the Son of God. Mark further recounts a testimony of one who was immediately, I believe, brought to salvation by the power of the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ that was being offered. Then, then. Remember, this is a, this is a Roman soldier. This is a Gentile. He stood facing him. Having looked at all that had happened, he stood facing him. The Bible recounts. And then he said, truly, this is the Son of God. Many, many commentators don't believe that he actually became a Christian. They dismiss these words to be an understanding that Jesus had been deified, if not simply that he was a good man, like a son of a God. That's what many people would say. But we must realize that Mark's precise purpose in re recording the centurion's words is not only to reveal the identity of Jesus, but it is also to demonstrate 
the efficacy, the power of the sacrifice that has just been offered. What the high priest Caiaphas and rejected the previous night, he had rejected it with a lot of indignation. That which Pilate and sarcastically dismissed, this is what this unnamed Roman centurion comprehends by faith in full conviction. And John recounts for us, they will look on him whom they pierced. That's what this man did. He looked on him whom they had pierced. Because we know that the sacrifice of Christ was not just for the Jews, it was for the Gentiles also. But we also read of this gathered community of the redeemed. There were other people named women, the women in the vicinity. And we see the connection of these with the, with the Roman centurion by the word also. It's used twice. It's there in verse 40. It's there in verse 41. There were, there were also women. And they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. They were looking on Jesus. They had followed him. They had ministered to him. Their interest in him had not waned even when he was in weakness, even in death. Because, as you know, they even went to look out for him. In this passage, verse 47, we read again, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Interest in Jesus continued to build even in death. I don't think that this interest was just some curiosity because it is sustained through all this. We also read that uh, even two days later in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, that when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. These women dis demonstrate and display such unreserved loyalty to Jesus. They were there looking at everything that was happening carefully, inten intently, and devoutly, with faith, their loyalty, their courage, and their devotion surpassed that of most of the disciples. And so they were faithful and qualified witnesses of the death of Jesus, his burial, and his resurrection, more than anyone else. And it is upon these facts of these women that the church has been founded. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul records not just the death, but also the burial and the resurrection. Facts that were attested by these women. And what this means is that the death of Christ is attracting a following from all without distinction. No one is rejected. Everyone is welcome. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor, nor free. There is no male and female. 
for you are all one in Jesus Christ. That is what the cross of Christ accomplished. It gathered a community of the redeemed from every gender, every race, every language, every tribe, every nation, and we shall all stand before him in glory. So then all I can say now is how remarkable was Christ's death. He was made a curse for us. He became a substitute for sin. He died for sinners. Jesus Christ died. But friends, that has implications for you. How can you possibly neglect such a remarkable death? If you are saved, you've been saved because of such a great atonement. If you are not saved, you can only be saved on the basis of this death and no other. Your only hope is found in Christ and in Christ alone. For his was a propitiatory death. If you are here to grasp this doctrine, then you better do today. But it's not just the understanding of the doctrine that you need. You need Christ himself now. But secondly, how great is the grace of God in the death of Christ? Grace that he sought to arrest the attention of the religious in the temple by the reading of the curtain, but the grace that also went out to the religious by engulfing the whole world in darkness so that this does not go unnoticed. By all, from every nation. How can you possibly keep on ignoring such glaring facts, such universal facts, and this to the detriment of your soul? As long as you've had these words, you must not ignore them. Like the The foolish high priest Caiaphas. Look up on Christ and live like this Roman soldier. You should realize now that if you believe in Christ, then you will not die in sin because Christ has died for sin. You will not taste eternal death because Christ has brought eternal life for you. You only repent your sins now. And in repenting, I want to tell you what that means because some children here may say, we don't know what that means. When you repent of your, uh, of your sins, You cast the burdens of your sins upon Christ. And the, and the death that was meant for you, Christ dies. And so when you say, Lord, I have lied. Lord, I have gossiped. Lord, I have been a sinner. You are saying, Lord. Take my sins and make them yours. Give me your righteousness that it may be mine. That's what is repentance. In repentance.
repenting your sins, you give up all your sins to Christ, and you give them up completely. But you're there, you're saying, I am saved. The Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. So then I ask you, have you depended on yourself for salvation? Having been saved, have you walked in this grace? Because there are those of you who are struggling with doubt. You lack assurance. You are living in the dungeon of the giant despair. Although you name the name of Christ, I pray that this message will unshackle every chain and it will draw down every hinge that holds the door of that dungeon because you see very clearly it does not depend on you at all I know that you come into these doubts Sometimes because the devil is very keen to fire his fiery darts to you, against you. He is constantly attacking you in your conscience. And you forget these glaring, wonderful facts. I pray that by this reminder then, you will tell the devil, do you not realize that my Savior liveth? But again, if you have abandoned your sins to Jesus Christ, but you've gone around again and claimed some of it, and so you are discouraged, I want to speak to you as well. Because that shows that you are still, you still want to depend on you, on yourself. And I'm telling you, it didn't work the first time, it's not going to work now. Cast all your sins to Christ and give them up. Repent again. Don't be tired of repenting. When you fall into sin, you fall into the mire of sin. And it's terrible that a Christian who's been redeemed by the blood of Christ should fall into that bad pond of sin. And wallow in sin. When Jesus Christ took you from it. It's terrible. But when you do that, he is a very gracious Savior. He will welcome you again. Remember, he welcomed you the first time. He will welcome you again. When Peter, we read the other day, abandoned Christ and he denied him. Not once, not twice, thrice. The Lord again restored him. And he made him not just a saint, but also an apostle. And he told him, look after my flock. Gave him a responsibility. So, rise up. Because a righteous man may fall even seven times. But by the grace of, by the grace of God, he shall yet rise again. But finally, would you notice that it is possible to be forsaken of God and still be loved of God at the same time? Because God will not smile at sin. He won't. Christ was forsaken of God and still he was loved of God at the same time. There are those of you who feel forsaken of God. And rightly so, because you've sinned against God, who is infinitely holy. You've broken his law, and your conscience is eating at you. Again, as I have already said, the solution is to repent immediately. Because, you know, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Yes, you can find his favor again. You must not despair of the Father's love. Rather, realize that the Father will chastise you because he, dip, he disciplines those he loves. For the moment, all the discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the, fruit, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Even our Lord Jesus was forsaken only for a season. So do not hastily conclude that you've been forsaken of God forever. There is hope for you in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. Shall we rise up on...